Welcome. This is Vespers at Freedom Village. My name is Chaplain Michael Hales. I'm glad you could join me this afternoon as we enjoy God's Word, praying, and coming together as one body of Christ. Even though we are separated, uh, we can still come together. And I ask that we could do that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a reading from Psalm 66, verses 7 through 12 and 16 through 19. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip? For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet, you have brought us out to a place of abundance. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. I'm going to read that again using a more contemporary way of praising it. Everyone, bless God, so we can hear your voices. He kept us alive and stopped us from falling. Yes, God, you tested us to see what we believed. You really caught our attention and opened up difficult things for us to deal with. You let people push us around it felt like we were going through fire and water. But you brought us out safely into a really abundant place, a wonderful place. Come and listen to me, all of you who think about God. Let me tell you what he has done for my spirit. I really cried out to God aloud and shouted praises to him. But if I had had another agenda in my heart, God would not have listened because I was not being real, not being honest. But God really has heard. He's actually checked through fully what I was praying to him about. This is Psalm 66. The Collect for Today O oh God, you have prepared for us who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from First Peter Chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. 
This is the word of the Lord. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, we thank you that you suffered once for all in your righteousness for our unrighteousness so that we could come to you Cleansed by your sacrifice, we died in our flesh, but have been made alive through your Holy Spirit. As the prophets of old spoke, by your Spirit moving through them, they preached repentance and were saved by your freely given cleansing. As when Noah saved his family through the waters of destruction, you enabled us to be saved by an absolutely true belief and love for you inwardly, accompanied by an outward sign of baptism. Only through your death and resurrection could this be. Therefore you are the final victor, and all angels and demonic powers have been placed under your authority. So we rejoice and give thanks, knowing that through Christ we can join in his victory through the grace of God and obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us pray for the country. We pray for our President Donald. We also pray for our governor, Ron. We lift up to you all those who are responsible for the decisions being made as this country goes through this attack by the COVID-19 virus. Lord, we pray that you would bring forth your leadership of excellent quality, that we can trust that we're being guided by your hand, and we ask this in Jesus' holy name. And Lord, we lift up those who are fighting on the front lines this pandemic. We pray that you would protect them, deliver them from being taken by this virus through the long hours that they work. We lift up the nurses, the doctors, and all those who have to deal directly with the death of so many people here in our nation. With over 80,000 deaths, the US is the most affected nation by far at the moment, Lord. We need your help. We need your help, Lord. Guide us and keep us. We lift up our community at Freedom Village that you would bless it and move it forward, that we can again become able to enjoy meeting with each other in the flesh when it is safe to do so, that we can again gather together to worship you, Lord. 
We lift up our families wherever they are, that they would know you and walk with you, that you would protect them through all of these attacks in Jesus' name. We especially pray too for those who have lost their employment. It's now in the region of 20 million people in America. And the consequences of that are far more than we can fathom. It is the worst job loss figures that this country has ever experienced. Lord, this country needs you. We all need you so badly. We pray that it can become one nation. Come before you, Lord, as one nation that you would lead us, move us forward with you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Please say with me the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, our Gospel reading today comes from John. And it follows on directly from where we were last week. And the headline for this says, Jesus Promises the Holy Spirit. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as a Christian, I can tell you that you will never be left alone. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> You'll never be left alone. Do you remember the beginning of that reading from the Gospel? It says, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So why is that inevitable, that we keep the commandments? Because part of being in love is the manifestation of true obedience. And what we also need to know from that reading is that 
this love that Jesus is talking about, it doesn't only go from us to Jesus, if you love me, it also goes from Jesus to us. And much more than that, it goes from Jesus to God the Father, as well as from the Holy Spirit to both of them. So, there's a whole lot of love going on in there. There's a whole lot of bonding. There's a whole mystery of how it all works. But in the scripture, we can recognize what we call the Holy Trinity. Now, maybe I can give you an example that would help to visualize what the scripture is telling us. I don't know if you can remember being in chemistry class. Well, I can. In those days, there used to be a blackboard. I don't know if people remember blackboards. Anyway, and if you can imagine being in a chemistry class with a blackboard and the chemistry master is drawing the picture of some kind of atom. And he has God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're bonded together with connections. They're bonded together. And those connections are love. Each one is bonded together. The, the, the Holy Trinity is bonded together. Now, if you can imagine that we're invited through Jesus Christ to be bonded into that. So you and me and our little fallible selves can become another bond into that Holy Trinity. And we're not only bonded to Jesus, we're bonded to the whole Trinity. In fact, we get bonded so much that Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to come and live in you. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each one has a persona. Each one has its own privileges or experiences or their own work to do. But they work together as one. They're in love with each other. They know what each one is doing. It's an amazing understanding of God. But why would God let us join into that bonded trinity? Well, John 3.16 reminds us, probably the best known scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we just have to believe in Jesus and we can join the Trinity and then we will have a bond, a close bond and we will want to be obedient. We will want to have a relationship with God, have a meaningful relationship with people around us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your strength and with all your might and love your neighbors as yourself. The connection up and the connection out. So why did God set this all up for us? Because God doesn't want us to be left alone. He wants us to really know, to really know, that he will always be with us. I remember when I first went to boarding school in England. For me, it was a hard place for me because even though I traveled in Pakistan and lived in Pakistan and England, I'd always been with my parents. I'd never been separated for an extended period of time from them. 
and ending up in a dormitory with a dozen boys in a cold school far away from anything that I was familiar with, I did feel totally alone. Except, I had brought a Bible with me. And I tried each night to read the Bible. However, for a boy of my age, it really didn't help. It didn't comfort me the way I was looking to be comforted in my naivety. I thought that I could read the Bible and be comforted. I'd seen my parents get comfort from reading the Word. I started at the beginning and soon I got totally lost in the intricacies of the Old Testament by King James's translation. So with even that part of godly support that I thought I could rely on, it wasn't there. I felt alone. In fact, I felt abandoned. But being a good little English child, I knew I had to be quiet and grow up. But the reality was, even though I could not understand the Bible, Jesus was there. And the reality was, there were many people who were looking out for me. My parents still loved me, but they couldn't be there. They had to be in Nigeria. I had aunts who loved me, but they couldn't be there either. They had their own lives to lead. But I find it very fascinating that Jesus gives us this advice in James 1.27 says religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world it's significant that Jesus asks us to take care of the orphans and the widows, those people who don't have someone with them, nobody to guide them and keep them, give them love, open doors for them, bring them a cup of tea, for goodness sake, but just live with them and love them. But you see, we can always trust that Jesus will be there for us. We can always trust in that. If we're in a place where we are by ourselves, maybe our spouses can't be with us, or maybe our family, our children can't be with us, or maybe we're in a place where not even a nurse can be with us. Jesus always can. He's always listening to us. After all, He is a jealous God. He likes to know that we love Him. And he likes it when we say, I so much love you, Lord. I'm grateful for all that you've done for me. Please be with me today as I go through my day and guide me. For us to be bonded with the Holy Trinity, that's a huge gift to be blessed with. And it's more than I can fathom sometimes. If we truly live knowing how powerful the gift we've been given is, we would yearn for everyone else to have it as well. We want other people to know about God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We would love our neighbor enough to know that they would need him too. 
So Lord, I pray that we can be guided by you to know how deep and how strong these bonds are. Also that we could really fully live in the fullness of what you have given us in the Holy Spirit. We are now your physical representatives here on earth in a world which desperately needs to know you more. You equipped us with the Holy Spirit, but we so rarely ask for his help. In fact, many of us have never truly seen or known what the presence of the Holy Spirit means. And I pray that we can find that today. We recognize that the powers of the Holy Spirit are God-given for the whole body of Christ as we represent you in this world, Lord. Let your Spirit be used through us for your purposes, Lord, and give us the wisdom to know how to pray. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us that we will never have to be alone, that you are always with us. Amen. Well, please turn over these words that I've been speaking in your hearts and your minds and just gather from them that understanding of how close Jesus loves us, that he would let us into that bonding, that trinity. We're invited in if we love him. Now I'm going to leave you now with our last reading, as I've been doing, and it's, again it's from Acts chapter 17 verses 20 through through 31 and it recounts how Paul addresses the Athenians who are an educated bunch of people educated that they debate they philosophize and they spend their time thinking about difficult subjects so Paul comes to address them and listen to how he does it. He's introducing his understanding of God afresh to this body of well-educated people who have many, many gods that they have for all different purposes. But he finds one way of getting in. And listen to what he says. Please have a wonderful week and let's meet again next week. And now a benediction. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the holy covenant, eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Be blessed, go forth, shine your light on the world. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. This is the word of the Lord. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself to all gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for... In him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he, on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. God bless you all.